No, she's one of the I think, can do it standing. Yeah, I think I can just do it standing. Hello. This is this on? Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce the event now. Um, towards the end of my freshman year at Penn, I learned that I had been selected to spend the summer helping Dr. Call with research for his upcoming book on Kashmir's cultural productivity under the conditions of conflict. I was drawn to his project first and foremost as an English major seeking a more expansive literary background, but also after having spent a post high school gap year in Israel, I felt I could connect with Kashmir, a similarly contested, religiously divided region. Since my summer mentorship with Dr. Call, it has been a dream of mine to bring a Kashmiri writer to Penn, and I am so happy to see that dream being realized with a novelist as outstanding as Mirza Wahid. Before I introduce Mirza to you, I want to briefly discuss my interest in Kashmiri literature and explain why planning a Writers Without Borders program was one of my priorities as an intern at the Kelly Writers House this past summer. Though I have never physically been to Kashmir, it is through books that I have traveled there many times. During the summer I worked with Dr. Call, I read as much Kashmiri writing as I could get my hands on. Works like Basharat Peer's devastating memoir, Curfewed Night, and poet, Ag I don't know, I don't know, Aga pronouncing, Ali. yeah, Aga Shahib Ali's The Country Without a Post Office were especially evocative allowing me to glimpse beyond words like occupation and insurgency to something far more human. Yet as a fiction lover, I longed to lose myself in a great Kashmiri novel, which I found the following summer when Dr. Call suggested that I read Mirza Wahid's The Collaborator. From the first page of the novel, I was transfixed by the book's narrator, an anonymous 17-year-old boy who works a job no teenager should ever have to fathom. Under the orders of an Indian army captain, he surveys a local valley each day, looking for dead guerrilla fighters. The story is set in the early 90s, a time when it was becoming popular for young Kashmiri Muslims, disgusted by the unceasing Indian army presence, to flee to Pakistan in order to learn the ways of militancy. Wahid's narrator is one of few male youths left in his village, and his greatest fear is discovering his three closest childhood friends, all of whom have recently disappeared, lying amongst the corpses. Through flashbacks, we learn of the life these boys led back when they could still enjoy playing cricket and chasing each other through Kashmir's lush meadows. In showing us Kashmir past and present, where he provides a raw, heartbreaking portrait of this bloody conflict's very real human costs. I know that we will hear much more about both the collaborator and Kashmiri politics over the course of this lunch conversation, so I want to end by introducing our guest author. Born and raised in Srinagar, Mirza Wahid left Kashmir at the age of 18 to study English literature at the University of Delhi. He worked as a journalist in Delhi for four years thereafter, and in 2001 moved to London to join the BBC's Urdu service, where he is now an editor. The Collaborator is his first novel, and he was recently awarded the Guardian's prestigious first book award. I'm so pleased that he is here with us today, so please join me in welcome welcoming him here. I'm going to begin by complimenting Alexa because there are several occasions in um, a career teaching here where you are really grateful for the quality of students you have and Alexa certainly is one of those students who reminds me why uh, a person like me is as committed to the business of teaching as I, uh, as I am. So thank you Alexa and thank you for making this event possible. I'm going to usurp the writer's prerogative and read a paragraph from uh, this novel, uh, just to give you a flavor of the contrasts and, um, uh, the, that uh, Wahid is writing about and, uh, in some ways, the misery that he is describing. And I'm going to do that as a prelude to getting him to talk about uh, the history of Kashmir, uh, particularly in the post-1981 phase, which is when an armed militancy broke out and was largely crushed by the Indian Army but also the history of Kashmir that leads up to that moment. We might spend about 10 minutes doing that, and then we will do what I am personally uh, interested in, which is to get uh, Wahid to uh, talk about all the reasons that anybody, a thinking person like him, becomes a novelist, which, as we all know, is a challenging and difficult uh, process, and uh, it'll give us a chance to think about the connections between creativity of a particular sort uh, 
and a conflict zone. But here's the passage. It's very early in the novel. By the way, the 17-year-old narrator writes, did I mention there's a profusion of tiny yellow flowers growing among the grasses there? This is the valley, the high mountain valley that he describes where he has played as a child with his friends and where he now goes on the behest of an officer in the Indi in Indian army to search for uh, dead bodies. If you look from the top of, on a sunny day, you can see these tiny, these shiny objects scattered across the lush meadowy patch around the river. These are erstwhile legs and arms and backbones and rib cages surrounding by spark, surrounded by sparkling swathes of yellow created by the thousands and thousands of flowers all across the valley. In places, they have grown in great numbers around the fallen and the decaying. You can see bright yellow outlines of human forms enclosing darkness inside. It makes me cry. It makes me want to run away, to disappear. In some cases, the outline has started to become fuzzy now, with the tiny plants encroaching into the space of the ever-shrinking human remains. And I love that phrase, uh, ever-shrinking human remains with the flowers literally growing into them and covering them over. I don't know the name of the flowers, some kind of wild daisies, perhaps. This is a novel, as uh, Alexa told us, about a conflict zone, the conflict zone that is Kashmir. Waheed, I was hoping that you would spend some time laying out your sense, um, uh, quite synoptically, of what has happened in Kashmir, particularly since 1989, but of the years that led up to this moment of armed crisis. Um, thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you, Alexa, for making it, and Jessica uh, and Michelle. Um, I think we can start with 1989, when the armed insurgency starts against Indian rule. Um, until 1989, there, is, uh, there are successive governments in place, elected governments in place in Kashmir. Um, you know, elections like uh, elections happen everywhere. Well, some of them are rigged, some of them are not fair elections, but there are governments in place which are um, primarily pro-India governments. They are not separatist governments. They are not pro-Kashmiri governments, I call them. I, I don't call them pro-Kashmiri governments, but there are governments nonetheless. Uh, but because the dispute goes back to 1947, and it also goes back beyond, but we'll start with 1947. In 1947, as we all know, uh, the decolonization of South Asia happens. India and Pakistan come into being. Two new countries come into being um, uh, in, in a very bloody, bloody fashion, of course, you know, with, with millions of uh, people displaced and, and um, uh, hundreds and thousands dead. Uh, so, but these two countries come into being, and then uh, Kashmir is kept unresolved, because at the time, the, the ruler of Kashmir, the king of Kashmir, um, can't decide whether to go with Pakistan or to go with India. So India and Pakistan agree to dis decide the future of Kashmir later. Uh, the then prime minister of Kashmir, Jawaharlal Nehru, also uh, agrees to this and says, we will decide Kashmir later uh, through the UN. You know, there'll be a UN mandated plebiscite in Kashmir where people of Kashmir will be asked to decide their future, whether they want to join Pakistan or they want to join Kashmir, uh, India. Uh, there is no option uh, in the UN uh, provisions for independence, of course. Uh, but that plebiscite, that referendum, that, that act of asking Kashmiris about their future, asking Kashmiris what do they want to do, what, who, do who do they want to be, uh, never happens uh, because in 1947, uh, tribal raiders from northwestern Pakistan arrive in Kashmir in order to sort of, you know, annex Kashmir into Pakistan. And the king at that moment asks India for help. This is the first time Indian army lands in Kashmir at the request of this king of Kashmir. Uh, so they arrive on a temporary basis to repel these raiders from northwestern Pakistan. Uh, but as we know, uh, the, the, the army has never left since. They're still there and in growing numbers. In fact, now the numbers are so staggering uh, that uh, there's twice the number of American troops at the peak of the, the occupation in Iraq uh, or anywhere else. You know, it's, the, it's the most militarized region in the world uh, with uh, close to a million soldiers if you count the Pakistani soldiers on the other side. I mean, there's about 700,000 Indian soldiers in my Kashmir, in Indian administered Kashmir, Indian occupied Kashmir, Indian controlled Kashmir. And uh, 
and if you add the Pakistani soldiers, so you're approaching a million soldiers. There's a lot of soldiers surrounding and amidst a civilian population. Um, to go back to history then, so since it's left unresolved, there's growing resentment you know, from 1947 to, uh, let's say, 1989. Uh, people um, are fed up with, with uh, you know, corruption um, and India's denial to live up to that promise. Um, from 1947 till 1989, India manages Kashmir you know, uh, through various proxy governments, through what I call client elites in the state, who are quite uh, happy to you know, be uh, India's people in Kashmir because uh, for personal reasons, for vested reasons, it's, it's a lot of money India pumps into Kashmir. A lot of these elites are quite happy uh, to do India's job in Kashmir. So we've had successive governments, uh, all of them uh, corrupt, uh, including uh, the, the current dispensation in Kashmir. Uh, these are Kashmiris, I must add. These are, not people, these are not people from India. These are Kashmiris, but they're client elites. Uh, which happens in conflict regions uh, because the big empire, you know, nurtures and um, in many cases creates uh, these collaborators, if I may use a term from the novel, uh, to help uh, the, the big state uh, do its uh, job in Kashmir. So in 1987, there is another election, uh, jumping ahead, there's another election um, to elect a new government, uh, basically. And at the time, there's a new party comes into being. Uh, a conglomeration of many parties called MUF, Muslim United Front, which was uh, a party, which uh, a new party, which was basically wanted to contest these old parties. They wanted to kind of, you know, chuck these parties out of power, these traditional uh, political parties. And they, there's a bit of a wave in favor of this party in Kashmir, because people have also been fed up with successive governments. And this is still electoral politics. There is no militancy, there is no separatist insurgency in Kashmir yet. So this party, and people expect this party to come to power because there's a wave of support in favor of this party. But on result day, it turns out they just win about four seats mm -hmm. or something. There's a massive rigging happens. Uh, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, scale of rigging. That they, they're not allowed to win where we knew they had won. The results are fudged, they're stolen, and um, with the help of uh, a party in central India as well. The ruling party at the time in Delhi you know, is in coalition with a s local party in Kashmir, mm -hmm. and both these parties make sure that this new party, which Kashmiris support, doesn't come to power. The moment that happens, it actually happens like this. Young people who had campaigned for this party young people who had gone around neighborhoods you know, asking people to vote for them and had campaigned and worked very hard. They're so angry and they're so resentful and they're so disappointed that they just leave Kashmir and cross over to Pakistan to take up arms because this is the end of their hopes. They, they think nothing can be done because we had chosen this quite democratic method to have our say, to have a government we want, uh, but uh, India and the local uh, you know, uh, as I said, client elites deny that opportunity uh, in the most brutal, undemocratic uh, fashion. So these young people, actual people who young people who campaigned for votes and you know for this party, they just leave Kashmir and uh, trek across the mountains into Pakistan, as we say, Kashmir, to train as militants because they think the only way we can do this, the only way we can resolve uh, Kashmir, and the only way we can decide our destiny is wage war against Indian Army. This is the beginning of the armed insurgency. Before that, there had been smaller attempts in the 60s and the 70s. Al Fatah was one group, uh, which uh, groups people who had tried to, uh, you know, force a resolution uh, by uh, going underground and by becoming uh, militants. Um, but those were crushed quite quickly. And then this wave of insurgency starts. Thousands of Kashmiri boys go across to Pakistan. This is before terms like jihadists, uh, mercenaries come into being. These are young boys from my neighborhood. These are college-going kids, these are school kids. These are not extremists in that sense. These are not terrorists yet. You know, these, are not, these are not the Islamists we know of in the current geopolitical speak. Mm -hmm. These are people who were angry, who were fed up, who saw no hope. 
in their home, so they go across to become militants. Thousands of boys go across to Pakistan, return uh, to uh, Indian-controlled uh, Kashmir, and make uh, form militant groups to fight the Indian army. And as Suvir said, the, there is a massive crackdown by the Indian army, by the Indian state, and uh, in, in, in a few years, the militancy is uh, crushed. Uh, many of these people are killed, some of them are sent to prison, many of them die on the streets of Kashmir. It's, it gets very bloody and violent, and then you know what happens in insurgencies, then the civilians uh, are the biggest casualty. Uh, what also happened in the early 90s then, when you know, at the peak of this uh, armed insurgency, so fierce was the Indian crackdown that no one was spared. The, the Indian state chose to punish the entire population of Kashmir for daring to rise in rebellion against Indian rule. No one was spared. You, you could die, you could get killed for, for just maybe walking down uh, the street to get bread. Uh, in, in crossfires, in massacres that happened in the streets. Uh, in, in January 1990 alone, about nearly 300 people, 250 people were killed in street massacres, and these were not militants. These were people protesting against atrocities, <coughs> uh, defying curfews, and marching the streets, exactly like the Arab Spring now. You know, they were out on the streets, mm -hmm. but uh, the armed forces would choose to fire upon these protesters and kill, in one instance, 50 people were killed on a bridge. In another instance, 40 people were killed in a funeral process procession of a religious cleric who had been killed. So those things carry on for a number of years. I want to cut it short now. Um, in the end, uh, more than 70,000 people have been killed in Kashmir, uh, most of them innocent people. Um, and now in the 20 years, uh, the, the legacy of the conflict is 70,000 people killed, thousands in Indian prisons, um, nearly uh, 8,000 people who we call disappeared people. We don't know anything about these people whether they are dead, whether they were killed in the mountains, whether they are in Indian prisons. We don't know anything about these people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in a uh, very tragic uh, expression of that, uh, we have women who are called half widows in Kashmir. These are women whose husbands uh, never returned, and they still don't know what happened to them. And there, there are no answers. The state refuses to give any answers. So, but they can't remarry because they don't know for sure if the husband is dead. So since they can't remarry this, this term, which, I'm, which I have slight problems with, uh, but we can come back to that later. So they're called half widows uh, because they can't remarry and they can't, because their husbands haven't been declared dead. So these are many, many fa manifestations of what happens in a conflict region uh, such as Kashmir. And uh, so from 1947 to 1989, there are small attempts by the Kashmiri population to ask the Indian government to you know, uh, do something about their future. Nothing happens. From 1989 uh, until late uh, 90s, um, there is uh, uh, an armed insurgency, as I said, which is crushed, as Suvi said. You know, the Indian Army launches a massive, massive brutal crackdown uh, during which no one is spared. Um, and then from early 2000s onwards, the, the so-called separatists, and you know, because it's not really a separatist, it's a, it's a freedom struggle, uh, you know, people, or a struggle to decide uh, their own future and destiny. So from two, early 2000 onwards, it, the, the movement transforms into a mostly peaceful protest movement against Indian rule. Uh, because the militancy is all correct. There's only a handful of militants that remain in the valley. Uh, militants also committed atrocities, I must sort of, you know, go back, in the early 90s, because what happens is when you, when you have power, when you have weapons, when you have guns, uh, inevitably, uh, you commit atrocities. You know, they, they kill people, they killed informer who would, uh, people who were accused of being informers for the Indian government, they killed them brutally. Um, so, so the violence has been, uh, but there is no proportion, there is, there is a sense of proportion we must always sort of remember. I, it is only small compared to what the state does. That's my reading and understanding of the Kashmir conflict. Uh, not that the militants can be exonerated of their atrocities, but it's not, uh, as brutal and as uh, massive, as colossal, as what the Indian state does in Kashmir. So coming back to early 2000s, there's a transformation of, uh, you know, the, the Kashmiri population gradually decides that uh, because the armed militancy did not achieve anything, it has to be a peaceful resistance against Indian rule. That's what we have now. 
But tragically, again, in 2008 and 2010, these, this civilian uprising against Indian rule takes the form of what we just saw in the Arab Spring, exactly like that. You know, uh, every single detail is similar. You have thousands and thousands of people, young people, on the streets of Kashmir demanding freedom, demanding you know, end to atrocities and the end of uh, dark laws that are prevalent in the valley. Uh, but the Indian state responded exactly as they did in early 90s when they were dealing with an armed insurgency. They just uh, met these peaceful protesters with guns. And in 2010, which uh, uh, I've said this before, is, is, will become a landmark year in the history of Kashmir, uh, 120 people are killed. Uh, the youngest was eight years old. So to a writer and to a Kashmiri and a political writer such as me, this I it's astonishing, it's frustrating, it is tragic, it, it fills me with despair and anger uh, sometimes that, you know, this is the world's largest democracy. And how can you claim those credentials if you do this in what you claim as an integral part of India? You know? uh, 2010, the, the protests were largely peaceful. Yes, th these people throw stones. In, in the style of the Palestinian uh, Intifada. Um, while I don't want to romanticize violence or, or, or you know, uh, condone it in any manner, but what will these people do if there is no justice at all and there is no hope? These young people have nothing. And they, this is very careful. They, do, they choose not to go back to the gun because they know that it's not going to get them anything. And they, they, they choose not to go back to the gun. That may happen, which is a very, very scary scenario. Nobody wants a return to arms in Kashmir. And these young people decide very carefully, this is not just uh, involuntary, uh, an involuntary decision. People know that we don't want to take to the gun. They come out in the streets, and uh, the armed forces, the local police, uh, just uh, basically murdered them on the streets, is how I look at it as a writer, as, a, uh, uh, as an artist. Uh, for... Um, for nothing, for for a simple expression of dissent. Uh, and yeah, sorry, yes, um, uh, I'm just going to stop you for a minute, Bhai, because uh, <coughs> well, this is the context that you have so lucidly uh, outlined for us. Add to the context. No, I, I don't want to do that because I want you to be uh, talking uh, about the situation, but also more particularly because for this audience, I I know it's very interesting. You say you were moved by this, as was I when I visited Kashmir after many years. I, and I was appalled by the, the fa facade of Indian democracy. So my responses to what was happening in Kashmir were born out of my sense that as an Indian of Kashmiri descent, I could not <coughs> get used to the idea that I was living in my homeland, both as a province, as a state, and as a nation. But what I was watching is not an Indian democracy that I was willing to participate in and allow to legitimize itself. So I began to do my own reading and my own writing. And that's where I want to take you to, which is uh, to talk about that difficult process where you go from a young man who grows up in Kashmir and then goes to Delhi University to study, but always with a sense that what you want to do is to intervene in this process by writing. Because that's not, as all of you are aware, it's not something that comes easily. We are all trained, uh, especially the middle classes in South Asia, we are all trained to become professionals of one kind or the other. And the profession of a writer doesn't quite cut it. So it's a huge decision to make, to sit down and decide to write a novel to see how it works. And so I would like you to describe yeah, that process. Of inspiration. Indeed, indeed. Um, it's, a, it's a complex question because uh, it, there are basically two parts to this question. One is how do I decide to become a writer? And, and then how do I decide to write the kind of novel uh, I, I, I wrote? And for me, they, they won because as a young person, if you're slightly bookish and you have delusions of you know, being a, a writer or having something to say, uh, you read books and you know all kinds of books and you write. Uh, I wrote a lot of bad poetry when I was young. Uh, insufferable. Uh, <laughs> I destroyed all of it. And, uh, and then, but at the same time, your experience as a young person in Kashmir uh, cannot but influence you in, in a big way. 
uh, your sensibility both as a person and as a writer, as an artist. That's what informs you. If you grow up in that place, in, you know, if you grow up in Kashmir, you're essentially inhabiting what is a colonized space in every sense of the word. Not just your street, not just the physical space, your mental spaces, your spiritual space, you know, your, your idea of who you are or you could be is colonized. In, in ways I have uh, discovered only when I grew up. At the, at the time, you don't really know what's happening. You, you have an inkling of this, this is wrong. This is not how uh, one should lead a dignified life. But you don't really know that until you grow up and you begin to process these things. So I, if I inhabit that space, I'm, you know, I'm slightly bookish and I'm, you know, um, um, and I think I can write. And then this happens in Kashmir as I, as I, when I'm a teenager. Um, you live under what you now I think retrospectively is one of the world's largest military occupations. Um, that informs your sensibility as a writer. And so I was writing you know, small bits, stories, based on what I was seeing around myself and trying to think, as I said, deluding myself into thinking that this is, I'm creating literature and you know, art and, and uh, you know, but they were basically sketches and short stories and I still have some of them. And um, but then, as I said, because I studied literature and I had this thing on my mind for a number of years that I want to write, and, and, um, and I toyed with the idea of writing a non-fiction account of my, you know, uh, of Kashmir and what happens in Kashmir. And I couldn't do it um, because I don't think I was up to it, and it required a lot of research uh, as well. Um, and and the novelistic form, going back to my sensibility as a writer, appeals to me a lot. I think it's one of the best uh, inventions of mankind. Uh, you know the form of the novel. It's 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 so free, and you can do s anything with it. You know, somebody when this book came out uh, met me and praised the novel and said, "But it's a human rights novel." <laughs> and I said, "But th is there anything wrong with the human rights novel? You know, why shouldn't there be a human rights novel? Although this is not a human rights novel, um, it can do you can do so much with the with the novel. And because I studied the novel as you know as as part of my literature uh, BA and MA, um, so it appealed to me. And then. In London, I um, basically decided not to win a weight anymore because I was growing old, and you know, <laughs> and, and and I I just I just embarked on it and um, and wrote it quite quickly. The first draft. How long was that process? The process of writing and the process of I wrote the first editing. draft in six to eight months, um, but then uh, I spent another year and a half doing a second draft and a third draft and because I had a full-time job and you know it, London is an expensive city you can't just stay home and write and you know um, so I worked for the BBC in London for for nearly for 10 years uh, but I wrote this while holding a full-time job but th but this this now I don't know what I'm going to do next if I'm going to do it right at the same intensity it, it this one had to be written I had a vague sense of that I could not not write anymore and and uh, which is I hope that's how it stays which is how one should write you know that So it was. It, the process was quite torturous as well. While it was delightful, you know, some on some days, but on some days it was it was it was it was full of torment because, you know, you're writing about a subject which is very very disturbing and 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 personally disturbing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what is quite remarkable, I hope uh, several of you will get hold of copies of this novel and and read it. What is quite remarkable is that it features this uh, this very young narrator who uh, grows from the ages of about 17, 17 to 19, to 19 uh, during the course of the novel, and whose primary characteristic, apart from his tenderness and his sensitivity, his tenderness vis-a-vis uh, -vis his parents, his vis-a-vis uh, uh, his friends, his sensitivity to all that is having happening around him, is he's suffused with resentment and anger. But it is a very, in, in, inside the novel too, but also in your telling of it, uh, this anger is an enormously productive process because it's an anger that knows the limits of the freedom of expression and the freedom of being. And out of that fiction emerges this story of a young man whose friends decide to take the momentous decision to cross the borders. There's one little uh, feature in the novel that I'm going to spend a minute um, contextualizing just to give you a sense of uh, Wahid's craft. Wahid chooses not to tell this story from the 
point of view of a mainstream Kashmiri, that is typically uh, a, a Kashmiri Muslim who lives in the valleys of Kashmir <coughs> and who could be seen as a representative young man. His narrator belongs to a smaller grouping of once nomadic peoples called the Gujars, who have for millennia lived in the higher mountain regions. They are not plains people. They've always distinguished themselves from the plains peoples, and the plains peoples have always thought of them as unlettered, uncertain, in the same way as nomadic peoples are thought of across the globe. So this young man is the second generation of a Gujar family that has settled into a high mountain village for the first time. So that village and this young man works out of a sense of their own difference from the larger community of Kashmiris who have risen up in arms. And for them, the loss of their young people is also a victory of sorts. That is the loss of their sons who have gone across to become militants is also for them a mark of some pride because in doing so, these young men have joined the larger Kashmir, uh, community of Kashmiris. But what this allows, Wahid, this point of view, the point of view of a minority within this larger movement for, from freedom, is it allows him a great deal of flexibility in asking fundamental questions about the forms of protest, the mainstream forms of protest, but also fundamental conceptions of the politics in whose name that protest emerges, because it's written literally from somebody who lives differently from the large mass of people. Do you want to spend a moment talking about that choice? This is not an unusual choice for those of you who read a lot of novels. Some of the most successful novels have worked from the point of view of a minority figure who is in some ways disarticulated from the mainstream but wishes to participate in that mainstream. And because of the presence of the Indian army is met with the, dealt with with more or less the same suspicion as everybody else. So that sense of this character who is a minority and who is always suffused with a sense of that minority distinction. Um, uh, this is a complex question and I have to kind of, you know, uh, commit the dangerous act of analyzing my own novel. In, in which one shouldn't do, <laughs> but because it's an important question. Uh, there were, I mean, primarily three aspects to this, the, you know, the, the narrator's uh, space and being where he comes from and where he lives in the mountains as the son of a erstwhile nomadic family. Uh, first of all, a very simple, basic physical reason. Because the action of the novel happens in the mountains, which is where boys Kash from Kashmir cross into Pakistan to receive arms and training and come back, mm -hmm. and which is where the Indian army engages them in battle. So the novel has to be set in the mountains because that's, where I want, that's what I want to explore. I wanted to examine those themes of violence, of dying and killing, you know, both. Uh, what happens in that theater, in, th in, that, in that brutal theater of war when, when somebody's job is to kill as many people as possible, and it's just a job. It's nothing. He, th this person is being tasked with, look, you've got to stop these people from coming over. The only way to stop these people from coming over is just gun them down. Even when they are going to Pakistan, when they're still not militants yet, or when they're coming back with arms and training. So you just kill them. And one of the characters in the novel is, this is what his job is. And it does strange things to his person and his identity. We'll come back to that later. So the boy is placed in that context because uh, he is in this border village. This village exists in the borderlands between India and uh, Pakistan. And uh, so I chose it for physical reasons. Mm -hmm. you know, this, he had to be there. He also had to be in proximity with the massive uh, security armed forces apparatus present in that uh, valley. He had to be close to that, 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 that machine in order to tell us what he sees. So I had to bring him close to that. Mm. But more importantly, uh, he is a minority figure, as Suri says. He is not a mainstream Kashmiri Muslim boy. He is a Muslim, nonetheless, but he lives on the mountains, both physically and metaphorically, on the fringes of mainstream society, which allows him um, a bit of, see, there are two things about this. One, it was also my way of hinting and asking questions about uh, Kashmiri's ideas about differences within. You know, because Kashmir is a complex place, uh, you know, 
and asking questions of the majority. The, I mean, these are bad words, but I have to use them. You know, majority and minority and all those things. Um, uh, reflecting on the, the, the role and the place of minorities within and differences within. Mm -hmm. That was one thing. Equally important also from looking at it from the larger state's point of view, which is, the, which is India in, in reality and as well as in the novel, uh, when they're looking at these this, uh, rebellious people and identifying the rebellion only with a certain section in the valley. But it turns out many people want to share in that rebellion as well, even if those people are not considered a part of mainstream by the mainstream itself. So I like that complexity. I wanted to. It was also for my own self. I was asking questions um, of my, my, of me as well. What, uh, what is my place uh, in, in, in this, in both history and and and, and that space mm -hmm. as a Kashmiri, as a writer, uh, you know, as a boy who grew up in in an urban setting, not in the mountains. I grew up in Srinagar, you know, in the most beautiful part of Srinagar by the famous Dal Lake. Um, I didn't grow up in the mountains. I didn't see the the the, the brutality and the violence of this of w what what happened in the early nineties. So this is my way. Of, I also wanted to transport uh, what I saw in Srinagar to a larger theater mm -hmm. in the mountains, mm -hmm. and uh, getting a boy from this nomadic tribe from the Gujars uh, allowed me that distance as well and some degree of detachment. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of ambivalence in this narrator as sure. well as I, uh, sure. you know, Absolutely. I, I read him. Uh, he's unsure sometimes about what he's doing, what his friends have done, unsure about uh, the, the cost of this war, the cost of the freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. you know. He's simply <laughs> clearly with the, the people uh, you know, who, uh, uh, who are fighting for their identity and, and freedom. And but he's ambivalent at times. He's not sure what happened. Mm -hmm. and, and that allows him uh, more ways than one of looking at you know, mm -hmm. India, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, that allows me uh, to ask questions of mega nation states, uh, what they do with smaller uh, sub-nationalities and their identities. I know these are bad phrases. No, no, and these and are these good are, descriptive are, phrases, are, yes. And, uh, but one has to use them, you know, because, uh, no, but personally, I don't really, I mean, a sub-nationality means nothing to me. Right, right, it's, right. Uh, you know, uh, three, uh, you know, cabin-sized houses in the mountains does not constitute a nationality because their idea of identity and nationality is their relationship with nature, with the mountain, with the trees, with the river that they own, mm -hmm. you know, because th that's it. Although if you, if you, if, if you, if you extrapolate that in s in certain parts of India, even that relationship is under threat. Yeah. You know, in the in the tribal parts of India, people who have s who have lived with their land and nothing else for centuries. These are, these are tribals who live in the forests of India, central India. You know, even that is under threat because the state and the big uh, multinationals uh, have their eyes upon this land, and for centuries people have lived off the land. They worship this land literally. And the trees and the rivers, you know, so, and that's under threat. That's a different part of India. Mm -hmm. So there are many <laughs> movements, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ident uh, for identity, uh, you know, uh, ongoing in India at the moment. Um, no, I, I mean this was uh, this was kind of important for me. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you have, you have. You know, I, I will remind all of you that for especially as a metaphor uh, of that resists the border, uh, the borders that nation states implement the sense of nomadic peoples. Borders happen to them. They've always known, literally for millennia, uh, millennia, that the high mountains, the rivers, the forests are theirs. They have moved uninterruptedly. 1947 happens, borders are drawn. Between 1947 and uh, the next, for the next 20 years, borders are militarized. So all of a sudden, areas that nobody cared about, where entire populations, um, there's this wonderful anthropologist who teaches at Yale called uh, James Scott, who has a, a book uh, talking about what he calls these zones that he calls uh, titled Zomia, the forests of the high mountains where people have for millennia moved as they pleased with a very different relationship, a non-politicized relationship to their environment. Along comes a 19th 
uh, essentially, essentially colonial development, the modern nation state. And what is the first thing that the nation state says to people like this? Okay, forget that these were your lands. Now we have a mental barrier uh, that bifurcates these lands. This is the nation. You choose one way or the other. And if you choose to cross without passports and permissions, you are doing something illegal. Anyway, on that note, these are the kinds of very important and consequential I and vexed one, questions. I wanted to add one more note. You know, the, the, the border uh, between Indian uh, controlled Kashmir and Pakistan controlled Kashmir is one of the most frivolous, stupid borders that ever was. You can actually see a small stream, yeah. and there are houses on the bank, opposite banks, which are two, which are fa which is which was one one family at one point, or or people marrying across each other and looking at each other like this. They actually they talk to each other across they, the they waters. Ha they have to shout. Yeah, and in some cases they actually, you know, if the, there's a house upstream, they will put in a bottle in the de ways we used to do in the ages past. They will mess put a message in the bottle, for literally, for the person downstream on the up opposite side to somehow collect it, hoping that it will get it to the in this day. Okay. And it's an artificial border. It's a ludicrous border. And, and it's one of the aspects of the Kashmir conflict that is not talked about enough. It, Kashmir is a divided place, a divided people. It was one. My grandfather, before 47, would bicycle from Srinagar, where we grew up, where he lived, uh, to Rawalpindi in Pakistan on a cycle. So it's it's one of those uh, it's one of the many many complexities that sort of you know and it's just it's a it's a um, you know that now it's become uh, on both sides more so on the Indian side that is what I it's you know the 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 environment the space Kashmiris inhabit now is one of what I call legal illegality is there are these laws which I think are unlike any other laws in the world. And and what I don't think they're called laws. So one of the laws is that any member of the security forces, armed forces, can arrest me if I'm walking down the street on mere suspicion mm. and have me detained for two years without trial. On mere suspicion. Or no, it gets it gets better. <laughs> or kill me because I might have looked uh, you know dangerous or or I made a gesture which might have appeared as I may be taking out a weapon uh, on a street. So the security forces on mere suspicion can shoot me dead. And But the laws, this law called AFSPA, Armed Forces Special Powers Act, means this soldier cannot be prosecuted for this act. Without the permission of the defense ministry, Mystery. which is never forthcoming. Which is, which is never given. So there are cases people go to the court saying, these three people who you said were dreaded militants, Turns out they were actually farmers who were picked up by a certain battalion of the Indian Army and passed off as militants after their faces were mutilated so that nobody recognizes them. And people have you know, put these cases in courts and said, now these, uh, the perpetrators of this crime, they need to be punished, they need to be prosecuted. With evidence from India's leading investigation agency called CBI, Central Bureau of Investigation. Evidence proving that they were armed army officers committed this crime. They picked these farmers and killed them to pass them off as militants for medals and rewards and promotions. Mm -hmm. And yet, the, 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 the permission to prosecute them is not given. So if you inhabit that space every day, you know, which my family still does and everyone in Kashmir does, it's, it's an ins it's a word of insanity. You know, it's just, uh, you know, I, I, I go back every year and because, you know, it's my, my, my my mother lives there and my sisters live there and I grew up there, it's my home. And every year I come back with more despair and more despair and more anger. It gets ludicrous at times as well because you see some completely comical uh, you know, uh, manifestations as well. You know, if I was, when I was a child I was uh, riding pillion on a bicycle, on a, on a, on a small bike, you know, a little higher than a children's uh, training uh, bike. And at the time, uh, they had passed this law that uh, motorcyclists are not allowed to have a pillion rider, <coughs> which was fine, motorcyclists and scooters. So I was on a bicycle the length of, shorter than this, I was young. So in comes this massive hulk of a soldier and stops this our bicycle. And my friend, uh, you know, 
uh, nicely enough, abandons the bike and me and runs. <laughs> and this soldier asked me to stand up. I stand up. I think now he's going to do something. He says, turn around. I turn around. Then he whacks me thrice on my bottom <laughs> for having been on, a, on, the, on the back of a bicycle. I look at it, I find it funny, really, because I, this soldier didn't even understand that moron, this was meant for motorcycles, not for bicycles. <laughs> what can a little boy do on a bicycle? He can't blow up a, 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 an army check post. I'm going to stop you just because I want five minutes of conversation with the audience, please, before we are we run out of town. This time, this has been lovely, but many there's a there's a mic. I have a mic just so that the audience. Oh, sure. Thank you so much for both your comments. Um, some of uh, what you're describing about Kashmir, uh, some of us in the audience know because we follow it fairly closely, as we follow other sort of news events. I'm always surprised by the fact how much there is a news blackout about Kashmir in the US. I would be curious, within India, do you find that there is a similar blackout? Because it's almost like citizens should be entitled to know about what's going on in their name. Uh, there was a blackout, and uh, if not an entire blackout, but also a certain kind of coverage of the Kashmir conflict for a number of years, which was uh, essentially what I call nationalist, which, which looked after India's interests in Kashmir rather than looking at what happened in Kashmir, uh, which happened throughout the 90s. And that too made me angry, uh, and many others in my generation and the generation after me. But of late, uh, uh, the last four or five years, it's beginning to change. Many, uh, if not all, uh, newspapers and, and other media outlets and you know are looking at Kashmir with new understanding and, and are saying, OK, maybe we should cover it uh, like you cover stories, uh, not just uh, from uh, the disingenuous prism of national interest that they have to, to know, be. Uh, so it's beginning to change, but not in a big way, but it's a good thing, it's beginning to change. In the US, you tell me, I mean, you know, please, <laughs> please. Uh, do you want me to quote, um, Kashmir is off the table? In, That's in exactly it's, right. It's off the table, but it was on the table. Before President Obama came to power, he had used the so-called K, K word. And I think he mentioned that the, that, the, uh, that the path to a resolution in Afghanistan goes through Kashmir. Not to politicize this too much, but he also used the H word. What was the H word? Oh, yes, 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 <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. I just wanted to say, Marine, that till about four years ago, it was very possible with some degree of credibility for newspaper reading, um, thinking Indian middle class liberals to say, oh, we didn't know what was happening in Kashmir. It isn't possible anymore. There's been too much writing and too much coverage out of there. So, uh, and uh, this is this coverage and, and this writing, not simply this novel, but other kinds of, uh, yeah. let's say, the higher journalism or even uh, yeah. slightly long form journalism. It's made it inescapable that what is happening in Kashmir uh, is one of the key flashpoints for something called Indian democracy. That Indian democracy, is, at this point, <laughs> is being challenged. Uh, by and is failing its own putative citizens in Kashmir. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's beginning to, uh, as we said, main, and there, as I said, Kashmir is a very complex issue. So people have been to look at various aspects. You know, the recently discovered mass graves in the mountains of Kashmir. Nobody's heard of them. It was, it's shocking. You know, th about um, 5,000 uh, unmarked graves were discovered in the mountains of Kashmir, some of the mass graves. Now, if these mass graves were made in Tripoli, uh, or made in Baghdad, uh, they would be like big news. Uh, but they haven't. Oh, and many other aspects. We had this tragic, tragic exodus uh, in, in, um, in Kashmir. You know, Kashmiri pundits who, you know, are. These are Kashmiri Hindus. Hindus, who were inhabitants of Kashmir as we are were. Um, they left in a tragic exodus in 1990. Uh, that hasn't been covered enough not with enough nuance and complexity, because some of them were targeted by militants and killed, uh, by militants of a certain denomination. And they were targeted and killed, and, you know, uh, and, and they had to leave. There was an atmosphere of fear that they perceived that you know, this, the, 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 the room and the ground for us is shrinking here, and it's dangerous. And they left. And it's a contested episode. Both parties you know, have their respective narratives. You know, Kashmiri Muslims m think that it was the state that orchestrated this. Exodus. Kashmiri pundits uh, uh, believe that they were the target of a concerted campaign by militants to drive them out. 
truth as always is, you know, I mean, I think both these and many other things are true. All those things are true. In what would you say? Yeah, yeah. In that, and that hasn't been covered as well. Along with, as I said, these mass graves, five thousand people buried in graves with no identity. You don't know who they are. And what is extraordinary is that uh, most recently, it's the state. So it's a statutory uh, um, political body, the State Human Rights Commission that has been responsible for the excavation of these mass graves. Now, if that is the case, if you have an agency of the state government actually detailing what's in these graves, then you would think that there would be a judicial follow-up, some kind of political fo follow-up. Well, that isn't forthcoming. Uh, yeah, my question is kind of two-folded. I was going to ask you about the role of British colonialism in the present situation of Kashmir because somehow this paranoia in the Middle East always that it's all in their hand, you know. It's like they divided the country, the, uh, the Pakistan and India, and they left the Kashmir there. And also I was going to ask you about the role of the religion, uh, because it seems to me that in Middle East and in that sec part of the world, somehow the militant Islam is a symbol of the resistance. And I wanted to know if there are other religious minorities also in Kashmir. Um, I, there are. I mean, there we have a sizable Buddhist population in, not in Mi Kashmir Valley, but in a region called Ladakh, very famous for its beauty and very popular with among Western trackers and tourists, uh, who have been Buddhist for forever. Um, and within the Muslim uh, in a context, uh, there are Shias in Kashmir. Um, and Kashmiri Pandits, as I said, you know, some of them, a handful of them remain in the valley, but many of them left in this tragic exodus, as I said, in 1990. They are Kashmiris. Um, and a small minority of Christians uh, in, in, in the valley. And six. A and six. Uh, 50,000 six. 50,000 six, uh, who would continue to live in Kashmir and are, and are fine. Um, they live alongside their Kashmiri Muslim neighbors and. It's a, well, I say it's complex, but the complexity does not take away, I'm going to close this now because I think we're running yeah. out of time. The complexity does not take away from <coughs> two broad facts that Kashmir is a big, big question mark blot on India's democratic credentials because how can you continue to be democratic if you do not issue even a routine statement about the discovery of mass graves in your back garden? And Pakistan tried to force a resolution by sending in uh, militants who were sympathetic to Pakistan in the early 90s. And Kashmiris, some Kashmiris, definitely I and many others uh, like me, like to believe that spoiled uh, the cause for a bit. Because that then the Kashmiri freedom struggle got uh, thrown conveniently for India's uh, benefit into the larger uh, war on terror bandwagon later on because everything was put in the same bucket in the same, you know, painted the same brush stroke. These are Islamist militants, who, who they were not. Or this is an Islamist insurgency, or an Islamist separatist movement. It is not. It is a <laughs> genuine people's movement for freedom and and and, uh, and and basically waiting to decide their future, as simple as that. And unless India and Pakistan ask Kashmiris and allow them to decide their future. Oh, and by Kashmiris, I mean all Kashmiris. I don't mean Kashmiri Muslims. I mean Kashmiri Pandits. I mean people in the mountains of Kashmir. To ask them a basic question, OK, what is it that you want to do? Mm. And if you don't do that, it's uh, going to continue and fester and, and end up killing more and more Kashmiris. If I can quickly respond to the first part of your question, I, uh, I'm quite happy to believe that this mess was created by the unseemly a way in which borders were created um, at the independence of, of, of India. But that is no longer an alibi for what has happened since. That was 1947. Mm -hmm. We are well past that moment. And if there, is, uh, if there are political entities to be blamed, it is uh, Pakistan and it is India. And in this case, because India has control over the largest part of the Kashmir Valley and, uh, of course, Ladakh and Jammu, these are the three provinces that made up the erstwhile kingdom of um, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, the, the, the primary uh, problem is um, India's uh, draconian handling of this problem. Uh, 
certainly post-89, but also before. But and yes, the original mess is the product of a very badly considered division of uh, mm. British India into India and Pakistan. The onus is on India, I, I like to believe. The onus is on India to solve this, you know, because if it wants to be the world's biggest democracy and a global big boy, um, you can't uh, have, uh, you can't treat Kashmiris uh, in this most brutal uh, manner. Uh, it's a military occupation for all practical and limp purposes because I grew up there under this military occupation. India has to end that uh, if it wants to you know, continue to be the world's democracy. And for many parts, because India is a functional democracy in many, many parts of India, not in Kashmir, not in the Northeast, not in the tribal areas. Well, uh, while I c I'm completely in agreement with you, let me remind you that America, as the world's most powerful democracy, mm -hmm. has equally bloody histories all across the globe. Yes, yes. And you know we function as a democracy here yeah, too. Yeah. So democracy is a very supple notion. We are able to incorporate a wealth or generate a wealth of human suffering and uh, not for a moment ask ourselves to reflect upon the assumptions that allow us to use terms like that. One last question, this gentleman. Uh, thanks. Uh, you mentioned um, in, uh, the paragraph in the beginning of the book about the atrocity of actually body parts and, and mm -hmm. the flowers growing out mm -hmm. of it. Are you familiar with Eric Maria Remarque's anti-war novel Made and Between quiet. the Wars, uh, uh, World War One and Two, written in the 20s, all quiet on, on the, the Western, Western Front, front. Yeah. from the perspective of a young German soldier yes, uh, who, who enlists out of college uh, when he's 18, and by, by the end uh, 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 of the war, it's where within weeks of the end of the war, practically all his friends are dead, uh, he reaches out for a flower, and, and he joins all his friends who are dead, uh, fellow college students and he shot killed. Uh, it, it's incredibly tragic involving, uh, involving a, a flower, as you yes, mentioned, yes, uh, flowers at the beginning of, of, of your book. Uh, as to the horror of war, uh, uh, souls somehow feeling it's romantic and not find peaceful solutions. But it's really telling it from the part of this young man, uh, as you're writing about a young man, who reaches for a flower and is shot killed within yes, weeks yes. of the end of the war, maybe he's 21 years of age, Thompson. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it's quite a book. If you haven't read it, you might you might. I, 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 I'm familiar with it, but I, haven't, I didn't read it uh, while I was writing the novel. F I mean, there are these four or five boys in the novel who are friends, and th there, is n there are tender moments in the novel as well. There are th th things about friendship and love and beauty and what happens to those things uh, in, in times of brutal uh, war. Thank you very much for being here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jessica. Oh, sure. By the way, we have some here back, so <laughs> people want to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Time comes. Time comes. This is the lunch hour. <laughs>